Hello and welcome. My name is Amanda Goodhue and I am an audiologist and an international clinical trainer with the Interacoustics Academy. It's my privilege to be here with you today and we'll be discussing how we can use the tools we have available and our understanding of how the hearing aid fitting patient is changing in order to improve the patient pathway for both clinicians and patients. So we're all familiar with the traditional patient journey. Now, not all patients will follow this process exactly, but on the whole, it's a fairly typical pathway. We start with the assessment stage. This is where we would take a history. We would perform some kind of testing, usually audiometry as a bare minimum, but there's a lot of other options available to us. And we'd start counseling when we explain the results and uh, start formulating a management plan. Next up, we would move along to the fitting stage. This is all about the device. We're setting it up, making sure that it sounds right for our patient. Usually we would perform some kind of verification, such as real ear measurements. And this is a really busy appointment. There's an awful lot to do, but it's so important that we take the time to talk to our patient and counsel them on their expectations, their understanding of the device and how it works and uh, what their responsibility and their family members' responsibilities are in terms of things like communication tactics. After the fitting, typically would come a follow-up appointment. And uh, this is really our opportunity to do some fine tuning to the settings of the device. Uh, here we've had the opportunity to learn from the patient's real lived experience of the device out in their real world situation. And that's really, really valuable. And this is also a really nice opportunity to spend more time counselling. I think there's an awful lot of information that we throw at our patients in the assessment and the fitting stage. and We can't expect them to retain it all. So the follow up is a super important opportunity to check that they've retained and understood some of those really important ideas and themes that, um, that we wanted to get across to them and also their family members as well. Also, at the follow-up, we might perform some kind of validation. Usually, this is something like speech testing, aided speech testing, but there are other tools available as well. It's really important we do this at the follow-up stage because the patient's had some time to acclimatise to the hearing aid and the sound of it. If we do our validation at the fitting stage, they haven't really had an opportunity to adjust to listening to the new sound quality. So the follow-up is the perfect stage for, for validation. After the follow-up, we move into the aftercare process, and this can take a lot of different formats. It might be some further follow-ups quite soon after their fitting. It might be repairs later down the line. Uh, it could be servicing, spare parts. All of that comes under the aftercare banner. It could be that their hearing has changed and it's time to do a reassessment and uh, start the process all over again. It's really important that we are reactive in this stage because we don't know what they might turn up with and what their issues might be. So we need to be reactive to their needs and their requirements. I think you know there's always opportunity for counselling as well. Um, some of the early information that we've shared with our patients can get forgotten over time. So it's always uh, good to take whatever opportunities we can to reinforce and re-emphasise some of those important messages. The aftercare stage is also where we might start thinking about alternative devices or technology. It could be upgrading them to a more powerful hearing aid, a different type of hearing aid, a different style of device, or we might be thinking about assistive listening devices or extra technology that can help them with their device. So now we sort of know what we're doing at each stage or what we could be doing at each stage, I'd like to spend a bit of time just exploring some of the themes and concepts that are important to get the most out of each of these stages of the journey. So let's go back to the assessment. Here, I think flexibility is really, really crucial. We might have patients coming in through all sorts of different routes and reasons and referral sources, but each of them has the potential to become fitting. And they can come in with different attitudes and motivations as well. Somebody might not be expecting to come and be told that they need a hearing aid, whereas another patient might come in for that express reason. And whatever their routine, it's really important that we're responsive and that our systems can work to be able to convert them smoothly from the, the patient they started off as into becoming a hearing aid fitting. Because we have a range of appointment types, we might also have different sites and different clinics with specific structures and procedures and equipment. Uh, for instance, one room might be set up purely for screening assessments. Another one might be geared up for more assessment and rehabilitation work. Uh, and to convert all of these patients into fittings where appropriate, we need systems with sort of connectivity that really allow them to work together across all of these different structures 
and afford that seamless transition uh, from sort of assessment to fitting. I think PC-based systems are really come into their own here. You can have them connected across rooms, across sites, and that sort of flexible modularity means that you can have the best setup for each specific scenario, uh, you know, whether that's a site, a room, a clinician, whilst moving the patients between them. So somebody could start in one place and end up with another with different clinicians, and having those connected PC-based systems means that all of that moving around, all that transitioning is seamless. It goes without saying that accuracy is vital at the assessment stage. A good hearing aid fitting starts with accurate audiometry. And, uh, you know, this comes from having well-trained clinicians and robust protocols, as well as good sort of patient instruction and being able to read the patient throughout the test and being able to pick up on any issues with reliability or compliance. But it also comes down to the room environment. This is essential, but it's not always possible for us to work in a soundproof booth. That's just the reality. Any tool that allows us to measure the noise in our room is really, really powerful in helping us to understand whether we're in an accurate setting to perform our audiometry. The ambient noise microphone that comes with the Affinity Compact does exactly this. So it provides a visual indicator um, as to the noise levels in the environment. And uh, this allows the clinician to judge then whether they need to alter the room environment, uh, try and improve the, the sound quality, um, or maybe it's just about repeating or rechecking a point of audiometry later on um, to see if it was accurate. But good, fit, good hearing aid fittings are more than just audiometry. So there are other tests available, you know, speech testing, the 10 test allows us to identify dead regions. There are loads of different types of tests that can look for retrochoclear pathologies. The acceptable noise level uh, test is really good for setting up hearing aids appropriately and so on and so on. And it's PC-based audiometry that's been really revolutionary in making these tests available and accessible really easily for us when we need them. So at the fitting stage, let's have a think about what really matters here. Um, I think, you know, because we've got all these different routes into the assessments, which then become fittings, the importance of PC-based audiometry sort of shines through here as well. Having those connected, integrated systems is vital for all of these different patient types that we might have, the different sites, different clinicians. But there's also other advantages to having these online connected uh, PC-based systems. We know that it's it's always risky to, to be working with manual results. You know, you might be dealing with data loss risk or you might risk losing accuracy if things aren't entered properly. Uh, there's nothing worse than going to perform a hearing aid fitting and not having any data or the wrong data available to you. We all want the best outcomes and, you know, to provide a high standard of care to our patients. And I think, you know, consistency and standardization is key so that every patient gets a really good experience. Uh, verification is a recognized method of ensuring that hearing aid fittings provide appropriate amplification. And there's a huge evidence base behind this. Uh, that suggests that verified hearing aids lead to higher patient satisfaction, fewer clinic returns, greater willingness to pay, better uptake and usage of those devices. So verification is part of that standardization process that means that all of our patients get a good quality experience and will then be satisfied with the service that we've been delivering to them. The fitting is the uh, busiest point and probably the most full and intensive session of all of the, the, the stages in the patient journey. And there's a lot to sort of be achieved and it's quite hard to predict, you know, will they understand what I'm saying? Will they like the sound quality of the device? Will they, um, will they understand the sort of the counseling? Will they understand the device programs and controls? Will they be able to physically manage it? What questions will they have? And so many of these issues just aren't apparent until they actually crop up midway through that appointment. So this is where efficiency becomes really, really important. And again, our PC-based systems help with that. They make sure that the hearing, aid, the, the hearing aid fitting is ready to perform regardless of wherever the patient was tested. They could have been tested in another room by another clinician in another town and uh, you know a completely different clinic setup. But however they came in, that fitting is ready to perform as soon as their assessment is completed. The results are stored, they're ready to work with, and you know that they're there and they're accurate. 
Relay measurements are is one fantastic way of providing efficiencies for the whole journey. We've already touched on the evidence base for fewer re clinic return visits and things like that. So actually performing that, taking that time to perform relay measurements and verification at the fitting has a huge knock-on effect on the rest of the patient journey. And, you know, there's um, counselling throughout. Um, this takes time, so any kind of efficiency savings that we can make will help with that. And there are lots of REM tools that can help improve the efficiency of performing your verification. Autofit REMs have been shown to be faster than traditional REMs. Binaural REM, what a fantastic, um, you know, sort of introduction that was, allowing us to, to verify both sides at once rather than performing sequential verification. The Delta Values tool that's available in the Affinity Suite tells you exactly how much gain you need to adjust the hearing aid by to match target. All of these things can help save time and make that REM process efficient and slick so that um, you know, you've got more time to perform that important counselling whilst maintaining the accuracy of your hearing aid fitting. So let's move on to the uh, follow-up stage. Obviously, this is um, patient satisfaction is something that comes from all elements of the patient journey, but I think it's the, the follow-up stage is actually really pivotal for ensuring patient satisfaction is high. It's your opportunity to fix any issues and uh, take on some counselling in a really personalised way. So they've had some time with their hearing aids, you can now improve the fitting, you can address their specific individual concerns rather than giving them gen general advice. This is really personalized advice. And you can troubleshoot any sort of specific challenges that they've had um, that may not be the same as somebody else's challenges. Our fine tuning is, is now based on their lived experience, which is so valuable. Uh, but I think we need to remember that it all comes back to the original fitting. The better the fitting in the first place, the less troubleshooting that we'll have to do at the follow-up stage. And then the more time we can spend counseling uh, which, as we know, is super important. When we come to the aftercare part of the patient journey, um, I think that, you know, as I've said already, this could be a range of different issues or appointment types, follow-ups, fine-tuning, reassessments, repairs. We've got to be accessible. Um, you know, whatever the patient's issue is, they need to be able to have it addressed. And so we have to be accessible. And we've got to be responsive and we've got to respond swiftly. Nobody wants to do without their hearing aids once they've got really used to working with them. Um, and this, this leads to sort of greater patient satisfaction and will really lead to repeat custom. And again, I think flexibility is really important in the aftercare process. Uh, we've already mentioned the, the benefit of PC-based systems. Being able to deliver your aftercare across multiple sites if need be is a huge bonus I think you know a lot of patients are quite willing to maybe travel for their their main hearing aid fitting, but for a small repair or a you know a small fine tune, they don't necessarily want to do that. They want something that's maybe closer to home, for instance. So you know offering that greater patient choice um, that will help with patient satisfaction. And again, if we're dealing with broader circumstances where people are being seen by different clinicians and in different sites or different rooms with different equipment. It's really important that those electronic records are clear and accessible to everybody. And again, this is where our PC-based systems become hugely beneficial. It's really important that we can quickly identify and address any issues. Um, is there a repair that's needed? Is it a fine tuning adjustment required? Is it a change of hearing that's taken place? And so do we need to do that full reassessment? And I think here, anything that helps us be more efficient in this troubleshooting process is really, really advantageous. So hearing instrument test box measurements, I think are vital in the aftercare stage. It helps us to quickly diagnose and identify the issue and, and work out what we need to do next with our patient. And all of this contributes to that sort of increased patient satisfaction. It can help um, you know, identify and target those patients who need a reassessment and therefore might be possible upgrades or additional technology. And that's obviously beneficial to everybody involved in the patient journey. So there are some limitations of the traditional patient journey. Now, it does involve multiple touch points, uh, which is inevitable to a certain extent, 
But the traditional patient pathway involves these being very much face-to-face. -face. So it's, it's a heavily face-to-face -face structure and it's also very structured and quite rigid. Um, and, and because of this structure, it means that there's quite intensive resourcing required. And that could be staffing, rooms, equipment availability, in order to uh, allow for that face-to-face -face contact to take place. And I think it's time that we started asking some questions about whether this is the most streamlined and efficient way that we can do things, not just for our patients, but for us, the clinicians as well. Now, one of the biggest changes that we are seeing at the moment in the world of hearing aid fittings is actually that our hearing aid patient themselves is changing. Our core older generation will always remain uh, with their typical presbycusis type hearing loss. But that age bracket is widening and I think the older generations are also increasingly technologically aware. A 65 year old of today is a much more technologically savvy than a 65 year old of 20 years ago. And I think, you know, what we're seeing is that the world of hearing health is changing. You just need to look at things like AirPods and noise cancelling headphones. Uh, there's an awful lot of very intelligent technology that's out there that is given a lot of user control. And so our understanding of hearing and sound and acoustics is really, really growing out there in the world. You just need to look at the data that is available to us on our smartphones or on our wearable technology. You can see how this is driving a shift in, in health attitudes generally, and hearing is very much a part of that as well. I think, you know, the, the patient of now and of the future are going to have much higher demands than we are historically used to seeing. They and, or potentially their family or their support uh, individuals, they're, they're much more consumer driven um, than previously. And this is only going to continue. Um, we're going to see a, a more sort of consumer driven focus on service delivery. And we're living in a much more instantaneous society these days. Once upon a time, if there was an issue with a product that we had bought or had been, had been given, we would return it, we'd have to go back to the store to return it or to, to address the issue. These days, customer service and support takes place through so many different media, so social media, email, a live chat on a website, as well as phone um, and, and the usual being able to go face to face and deal with it in person. And this is all very immediate and very flexible and very reactive. And it fits in around the lives of the consumer rather than the other way around. And I think we as an industry, um, it's becoming very apparent that that flexibility and that accessibility is expected from our, our patients and our end users. And this is not something that's currently found in the traditional patient journey. I think there are greater diagnostic expectations as well. Um, our patients are very well informed. There's a lot of information out there about what they could or should be expecting to happen in their hearing aid journey. And this has a great impact on patient satisfaction. Looking at how uh, a clinic can set themselves and their services apart from the competition, I think we need to be looking at what we can do diagnostically to, to really meet those expectations and then um, supply that patient satisfaction. So now we've looked at how the hearing aid patient is changing, how is the hearing aid patient journey changing? I think the first thing to recognize is that one size does not fit all. With all of these changes, the traditional pathway might work for some, but probably not for most and not for the future. The effect of the coronavirus pandemic simply can't be ignored. Um, this led to a very much needed, necessary reduction in contact between patients and clinicians. And one day that will all be behind us, but I think we will still take a lot of positive learnings from working through a pandemic forward with us and, and certain elements will be here to stay. Distance working and remote support was already on the rise before COVID, but I think it's really very much accelerated it. And, um, you know, this adds a lot more layers, it adds more options, it adds more possibilities to the pathways. And I think we're now going to see a flow between sort of remote and face-to-face -face working. We're going to have multiple pathways rather than one sort of single fixed journey that we fit all of our patients into. I think we need to recognize that the audiogram alone is not enough. 
We've spoken about that sort of diagnostic awareness and demands from patients. And, you know, we've got very, very sophisticated hearing aid technology these days. In order to get the best out of that technology, we need to program it well. And in order to program it well, we've got to do the appropriate, suitable diagnostic work to inform that process. And that brings me to the role of the clinician. I think remote working and distance support can make it seem as though the importance of the audiologist or the clinician is, is diminishing. But actually, I think it's the opposite. I think, you know, with all of these complex pathways and additional layers, we're, we're, we need the audiology, audiologist to be involved in making the appropriate decisions about that journey, about the diagnostic work, about the hearing aid settings. So if anything, the audiologist role is more crucial. It's just going to be different. Because there is that less contact, the, the audiologist's skills, their knowledge, their input so much more valuable. But what we need to do is actually project manage our patient journeys, and as well as providing that high level care um, and audiological work. So let's think about how the, um, the patient journey is evolving at the moment. With this sort of change in attitudes and patient demographic and needs and demands, we're shifting away from this traditional sort of linear pathway towards something that is much more complex. And we've got many potential twists and turns in the pathway, and no two patients will follow the exact same journey. Managing these new pathways is going to be a new and different role for clinicians and support staff. And it's really important that we do this if we are to secure that patient satisfaction and get good outcomes for our patients. We need our systems and processes to work to make this straightforward and uncomplicated. Those integrated, connected, PC-based systems are simply essential. We need to be online. We need to be responsive wherever we or wherever, wherever our patients are. Any staff member, any day, in any setting, whether that's online and remotely or face-to-face -face and in person, they need access to the data and the information about that patient. And we need our systems to help with these efficiencies. Something like the Interacoustics Universe tool, which allows you to sort of open and switch seamlessly between testing modules within one patient, is a really neat example of how these PC-based systems continue to evolve to support an efficient workflow. The changing patient journey is really leading to a shift in the way that we do our clinical work. You know, we've always seen the test battery as important. I think what we have now is really a toolbox of options. As clinicians, what we have to do is select the appropriate options from that toolbox, from each patient, so that the work works with their individual patient pathway. And the industry has been very much driven by hearing aid technology for a long time. We've seen huge advances over the last 20 years, which we are incredibly fortunate to have. But I think we're now close to a point where uh, excellent hearing aid technology is actually the standard. That's, that's the bare minimum. You know, patients expect their hearing aids to be as good as their other technology, as, as good as their phones, their tablets, their computer, their integrated, connected, voice-activated, intuitive, smart home technology. They want their, their, why shouldn't their hearing aids work in just as clever a way as, as that technology that we're all very used to? And so I think whether the patient is changing and where the patient journey is evolving, we've got a shift towards service delivery rather than the focus on the hearing aid technology itself. So let's have a little look at that, uh, that patient toolbox. You know, what do we have that's available to us in that patient toolbox? And this is by no means an exhaustive list, but rather a selection of options and some creative ideas for how they could be used. We've got automated audiometry. And we've even got screening audiometry available to us. And this could take place separately or before taking a history. This obviously leads to some reduced contact. It offers flexibility. The patient could come and do it whenever they want to. And it can increase productivity by taking some time away from the clinician. It means that that clinician is freed up to do some other tasks, see other patients and so on and so forth. Taking a history and debriefing results can be done remotely. You know, this is, is now become quite standard and is even actually some people's preference. 
Uh, it's not for everyone, but it's an option. And this can really help, again, reduce travel time for patients, reduce contacts, be flexible around their schedules, um, something they can do at home. You know, a lot of people want that, that service to be offered to them. I am a big fan of the SPL60 probe, which allows us to actually start the fitting at the assessment stage. You can take an RECD without the need for their custom ear mold. And it's an accurate tool for doing this. So it doesn't sort of um, diminish the quality of the hearing aid fitting. And some options for this are that you could program the hearing aid up and post it home to them, or they could come and collect it. Or you could program it before the fitting appointment, which again, reduces the amount of contact, offers you more time for counseling. We're seeing an increasing amount of remote access and sort of remote fitting options within hearing aid software itself. And, you know, this is only going to sort of improve and increase over time. And I wonder whether one day we'll be able to perform an entire fitting remotely. Who knows? There are lots of verification tools out there that have been designed really with the intention of saving time. But now we're recognizing that these actually help to reduce contact and automate the process. So I've mentioned already today binaural REM and how swiftly we're now able to do two sides rather than sequential verification. Autofit REM has been found to be faster than traditional REM. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Delta Values tool that allows us to know exactly how much gain we need to adjust our hearing aid by. All of these things makes the, the verification process quicker, which means that it's less contact time and again, more options, more time available for things like counselling. The hearing aid transition test allows us, or the HAT test, allows us to maintain um, the audibility settings of a hearing aid, but you could maybe be upgrading or changing uh, a new user to your service who's an existing hearing aid wearer, or upgrading a patient of yours to new technology, but where you must keep the sound quality the same. Again, that can help to really sort of smooth the process, it adds efficiency savings, and keeps that patient satisfaction where it should be. Counselling is so important, I've said that many times today already, um, and where we can save time elsewhere means that the audiologist can really shine in the counselling world. More counselling is always a good thing. Tools like visible speech mapping helps to uh, explain and, un and, and demonstrate what it is that we are trying to, to, to communicate to our patients. And anything that uh, helps us to explain these messages better can be sort of more, make the messages more impactful. It means that the patient gets the concept quicker and then we can be more powerful and more impactful with our counselling messages. And the last thing I want to mention here is hearing instrument test box measurements. You know, this is a really swift and accessible way of troubleshooting and identifying any issues with the hearing instruments. And anybody can do it. That's what I mean by accessible. Your receptionist, an assistant, a student, an audiologist, anybody can do it. There's no need for a formal appointment to perform hearing instrument test box measurements. So this makes it a really flexible tool in our toolkit. And I think patients expect quite sophisticated troubleshooting diagnostics. Again, their other technology does this. Anybody who's had a problem with their computer, you'll see some sort of diagnostic tool crop up. And, um, you know, I think patients expect that we can do something similar with the hearing aids. And they want answers and they want them right away. And we have the tools to do this. We just need to implement them. So as I said, this is by no means an exhaustive list, um, but I hope it's given you some sort of food for thought. I'd certainly urge you to think about how these different tools can be implemented alongside each other and some of the sort of creative ways that they could work within this evolving hearing aid patient journey. <laughs>